Today on the Boo Youth Showcase, we will give our viewers a look into the different aspects of arts and how they intertwine with education. Sit tight, we will be right back with our guests. Welcome to the Boo Youth Showcase. My name is Jasmine Hall. And I'm Kasara Clay. Our first guest artist, Randall Holloway of Holloway Ventures Incorporated. Thank you for joining us today. It's a pleasure to be here. So can you give us some insight on your background regarding the arts in general? Um, well, I, I started art when I was six years old. It's interesting because I was sitting around my mom's um, living room and I just drew the entire living room. <laughs> and from that day on, she just had me in art classes all over the place. I loved it. I couldn't get enough of it. And um, that was pretty much where it started. I left there and went to Germany and did art. Um, I did uh, art, art showcases everywhere. Some of my art um, got sent to Africa in high school. Oh, nice. I was very, very proud of uh, all the things that I could do with art. And it gave me an expression and freedom that I had never, never experienced before. Right, great. I thought it was great. Yeah, it definitely is. So <coughs> why should kids read during the summer? Just to switch topics a little bit. Oh, okay. Um, well, because of the imagination. Um, as I grew up, um, you know, summertime became this really, really fun time to look forward to. Mm -hmm. However, um, when I would get back to school, you know, because I hadn't done so many things in, uh, in, in regular classes, uh, I would started falling kind of short. But um, the interesting part about it is I teach, I'm a teacher as well, mm -hmm. and I teach my children to make sure that they do at least some kind of reading during the summer. You would think as a visual artist um, that I would tell my kids to read books with pictures in it, but I actually tell them to read books without pictures because the, the pictures are actually in their mind. They have um, an opportunity to use their imagination, so when they go out, you know, and they get to play, they get to relive some of the ideas that they have in their mind from reading books without imagination. So I think it's a really, really good uh, opportunity for them to learn and have fun at the same time. Well, you mentioned Germany earlier. What made Germany so great for you? Uh, the freedom, the freedom. It was mm -hmm. so, oh, because it's, uh, it was a culture change. Mm -hmm. I couldn't speak the language. I had no idea. We, uh, my mom was in the military, so, we traveled to Germany and um, we didn't live on the um, military base, we lived off, off base. Mm -hmm. And uh, because we were right in the middle of the culture, you know, they were speaking a language that I didn't understand. But because of the opportunity of, of freedom, not using my imagination, being able to communicate with them strictly through the artwork um, was an experience that I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't imagine being able to actually communicate with people without using words. Um, I would draw pictures when I would go into stores. I want that. And I would draw like a little picture of it and show it to them and they would know exactly what I'm talking about. So, um, and not only that, but the cultural experience too. I got to see people of a different race who did things that were a lot like what we did. Yeah. And when I say we, I'm talking about American people yeah. and African Americans as well. Um, there weren't very many African Americans there. Okay. So I spent a lot of time by myself and um, talking about the imagination, you know, kids get an opportunity to do that when they read. Um, they get a chance to not think about anything but actually just indulge in the pictures that they see and I had that opportunity in Germany. Okay, well what did you learn most from your military and college careers? Oh, discipline <laughs> <laughs> and structure. My mom was in the military and um, because of that, we, um, you know, we did a lot of traveling around and, and I had to make my own bed, I had to clean my own room, I had to, you know, and she was extremely strict. I give a lot of credit to her for um, all the things that she did that installed the type of discipline that I needed because there's so much discipline in art. Um, like the painting that I, I'm showcasing here now. Mm -hmm. um, it, you know, a lot of people think that you can just take paint and just throw it on the canvas and, you know, it, it becomes this. But because of my military background, it, you know, I, I use a lot of discipline in putting 
um, specific colors and specific right. lines mm -hmm. into individual spots that make the painting come together as one. So I used all of that when I went to Duke Ellington, uh, which is a high school for arts in mm -hmm. D.C. Right. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, once I left there, I went to Howard University. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, Howard's real strict. You know, <laughs> they want them. It seems like it's a party school, but they, they, they are very strict when it comes to their education and their academia. And um, my first couple of paintings, I would try to just throw paint and you know I, I realized that I couldn't even draw very much we were talking about that before the show started how you know art seems to be something that's really really easy to do right. but it's mm -hmm. extremely hard mm -hmm. and uh, I think the military discipline gave me an opportunity to understand that put okay. certain things in a certain space and make artwork that actually appeals to people lets them see things okay mm-hmm Okay, so why is <coughs> art so important, I guess, in the world, and why is it important specifically to you? Um, it's a communicative language. Like I spoke about Germany. You know, art is it's a, it's so easy to communicate strictly through lines and colors. Um, it's, you know, dignitaries have used it. Um, dictators have used it. You know. I, Hitler used it a lot in the things that mm -hmm. he did. Um, even our President Obama, you know, had a logo that was yes. a, a major part of his campaign. And that's nothing but communicative art. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what I think that it brings. It, it's, it transcends language barriers. It's so, um, um, when it, even when it comes to sound, you know, you, if, if, you, if you can, you can see the lines will come out and they'll make sounds to you, they'll make music to you. So um, it transcends all different types of language and it, it becomes something that you can actually embrace mm -hmm. and it's so emotional when you look at it. Uh, even this painting, it's, it's so much going on that it brings out these wonderful feelings of, of fear or anger or happiness. Mm -hmm. My first painting, once I get out of Howard, um, I didn't know what I was going to do with my future. I had no idea. Um, and I got so frustrated one day, I just took a canvas and just, I went to town on it. I was like, <laughs> bow, bow. Just because that art had become such a place for me to go when I wanted to be free. And because I, did, I wasn't sure what I wanted to do with my future, um, I went to a place that I knew I was comfortable, and that was art. So that's why it means so important to me. Uh, it is it's so important to me. I think all kids should think about that when they're, you know, not sure what they want to do or where they want to go. Go to a, the place where you're most comfortable and, and think about the things that you like to do during that time. Mm -hmm. And you'll pretty much get an idea of what you want to be and where you should go and right. possibly even your purpose in life. Right. Wow. Right. So what is the state of art and education? Right now? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been teaching about Ten years. I taught four years at William E. Shout out to William E. Dorr Public Charter School. Very, very good school. Um, and then I taught um, at uh, Saint Elizabeth's Hospital with um, patients there. And um, my first year, my, my the year before this year, I taught at an autistic school, and um, the kids couldn't communicate very well, but they could communicate with my artwork that I taught them. And uh, I realize, though, now that it's, it's, it's very confusing for people when it comes to art. I think because artwork, primitive artwork, which is something that you possibly could call this, um, has changed so much. It's not in the, in the mm -hmm. forefront like it used to be because of social media. You know, everybody has a camera on their phone. Everybody can take videos now. Instagram is a place where you go and, you know, that's photography. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, it's in such influx because people, they don't really look at art the way they used to because it's not, a lot of people don't go to a museum or, I'm not gonna say a lot of people, a lot of people do go to museums, but because art is in your face so much all the time now, um, they tend to um, not appreciate it as much. So when I go to my classes, my kids come in and I'm telling them to put the pencil on the paper and 
I, I'm teaching them, I, I teach mostly elementary school kids, and it's hard because I tell them to draw a square, and they're, they're very scared to actually put the pencil on the paper and, and try to draw a, squ a square. Right. Or if I'm teaching them basic photography, mm -hmm. you know, they don't want an old-fashioned camera, but I need to teach them about exposure. I need the to teach them about right. focus. Mm -hmm. focus. And um, no, they want to do it easy. And I see all these pictures on social media that just look horrible. <laughs> and it's, you know, but at the same time, I think that, um, that it'll, it'll switch and eventually we'll come back to the basics and, and people will start to understand that without those essential discipline and structured things that you have to learn first, then um, you, you know, artwork won't be as, as creative as it has always been. Okay. Mm -hmm. So I guess that kind of led up to my last question just right quick. So can you give us your view on the future of art? You know, is it going somewhere? Is it going a good good way, bad way, yeah. you know? I think it's coming, it's going to make a comeback. It's, it, the interesting part is that because of social media, it's so exposed mm -hmm. that, um, but un until people really understand that it's actually art, it won't it won't be as good as it has been so people are going to start using that frustration and go back to primitive art and i think eventually it'll come full circle everything always does mm -hmm. absolutely well thank you so much with mr holloway for joining us today thank and you thank you for sharing your lovely artwork with us thank you stay very tuned much. we will be back with artists and a new author I think mentors like being a mentor because they'll really enjoy it. They'll enjoy the kids, they'll enjoy teaching kids, they will enjoy helping kids. They just love helping children. Well, I'm reading better now because of her. It really does make me really feel proud of her. My mentor is a great person. When I grow up, I want to be just like my mentor. Mentoring works. Become a mentor. Welcome back. We have with us Rose Jackson, who is an accomplished artist and has most recently added the title author to her bio. Welcome to the show. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. What are the books about? Uh, they're about a five-year-old uh, little boy who's curious about his missing red bow. Mm -hmm. And he uh, goes on a journey to kind of solve the mystery. And he thinks his grandmother, Rosie, has all the answers. So he kind of leaves Atlanta and traveled through the uh, other southern states to get to Maryland mm -hmm. uh, to be with his grandmother because he just dreams about what happened to it. Mm -hmm. And what inspired you to write the books? Uh, being a grandmother and my grandson, <laughs> um, in real life, uh, Carter, Curious mm -hmm. Carter in real life is three years old. In the books, he's five and older. Mm -hmm. uh, but he inspired me as well as one of my art students, um, Kimberly, who has uh, autism and she did not speak the first six years of her life. Wow. She drew everything. That's mm -hmm. how she communicated. She drew everything in detail. And I had an art program here in Upper Marlboro and she came to me so talented already. And um, she's been with me for like seven years. So, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so the Carter series. What age group um, do you think these books are these books for? Well, originally, <laughs> I thought the uh, age group would be for um, elementary school. Um, they can be read to kindergartners. Um, I plan to make them chapter books and take out a lot of the pictures for older kids in the middle okay. school. Um, but the grown-ups are having fun with these books. So <laughs> they're like, wait a minute, we like these books just as well as the kids do. So they are pretty broad. <laughs> okay, so like I was looking, and I see these are specialty books. They mm -hmm. have different themes. So can you tell us a little bit about the sponsors? Oh, the sponsors. Um, actually, um, legendary boxer Sugar Ray Leonard. Um, and oh, his wow. brother Roger. I, I happened to meet them in Annapolis with my art student Kimberly. Um, Roger had written a book called Living in the Shadow of a Champ and we got on their mailing list and I was writing the Carter series and because he has this missing rib he dreams of being 
Um, he could be a boxer or a Aww. teacher or a detective or whatever. So um, they gave us permission to use his name in the books. And then I have another artist, uh, Stevens J. Carter, mm -hmm. who uh, had a studio here in D.C., did a lot of my reproductions. He's out in um, San Francisco now, and he's the other sponsor. And then I have another uh, mystery thriller writer, uh, Austin Camacho, who kind of is like my mentor and, and got me introduced to writing and, and um, asking good questions about publishing and mm -hmm. how to get started and, and all those things. And, and then I have a cousin who ha has a company called um, uh, Dolls with a Scent. Mm -hmm. and she hand makes them. And so these four people have supported me for years through the arts and now um, through the books. Nice. Mm -hmm. Well, this all sounds very exciting. Yeah, it Can is. you kind of tell us what have been some of the highlights for you going through publishing a book? Uh, going through publishing is um, writing the manuscripts and then pulling the illustrations together and then sending them off. Although I'm a self-published um, author, I have a self-published publisher, Sue, okay. who lives in the, far away from here. Mm -hmm. um, she takes all my manuscripts and pictures and brings the books together, formats them, and put them on um, Amazon and all those things. So that's been exciting to see the you go from a white piece of paper to writing the manuscripts right. and then to actually see the product come right. back and yeah. <laughs> you know, the proof. So that's been exciting, as well as sharing the books and the stories and meeting a lot of parents and children. And, and I, I ask for their names because mm -hmm. Carter meets a lot of children through his journeys. And so I get to use their names oh. in the books. And nice. it's just uh -huh. fun, just yeah. fun. It sounds like it would be, definitely. Mm -hmm. So I know since you're also an artist and you have taught it, how would you say writing a book might go hand in hand with education? Uh, with education? Um, whew, um, both art and writing is using the right side of your brain. And um, being that I work in the federal government, I'm having to use both sides. <laughs> <laughs> I thought that, you know, as a kid, I loved drawing and arts and thought that I could hide behind a paintbrush quietly doing artistic stuff. Mm -hmm. But my work in the government required I be a good writer, a good reader, you know, math and art has all of that entwined in it. You, you know, you have to be able to mix colors and that becomes like the science part of the uh, oh, art okay. and mm -hmm. education. And math, when you're building things and doing sculptures, you've got to measure things. Yeah. And so uh, it just goes hand in hand with your creative mm -hmm. side. It's a nice outlet, you know, to express yourself through the arts. Mm -hmm. Okay. Is there a link between the arts and education, and was it difficult going from, you know, being an artist in that sense to becoming an author? It wasn't hard for me um, because my work <laughs> in the government required I write a lot. I was a technical writer. Right. And so the writing part was the area that I was weak in because, like I said, I dreamed of being an artist and a painter. Mm -hmm. um, but writing, I really had to learn. And now that I got it, it makes it easy to make that transition, and I'm really enjoying it. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. We be publishing any more works in the future? Should we be on the lookout? <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to do a cocktail uh, book about all my art pieces. I have like thirty some um, pieces in my collection of art, um, and then I like to see where the Carter series of books take me, and maybe Carter plays football or something since he has oh, a missing rib. Okay. But um, people would like to see him. Um, you know, do something uh, sports-like since he's a boy mm -hmm. uh, in the book, so. Okay, and I know we've been just so busy speaking about the books that you have published and mm -hmm. worked on. Do you have any personal favorite books that you enjoy to read on your spare time? On my spare time, I like uh, self-help books. Mm -hmm. You know, I like fitness. I like, um, you know, try to eat right. Um, 
mostly self-help books. Uh, I do like the, um, the mystery thriller writer. I mentioned my sponsor. He's a phenomenal writer. Mm -hmm. I love reading his books. Uh, they're about places in D.C. and Maryland, Virginia, where he takes his character as a detective through. So those books are really fun to read. Um, and I've been busy, you know, <laughs> multitasking a full know, career. I'm a mom, a grandma, <laughs> I'm a writing, I'm painting. <laughs> so I haven't really had time to really focus on a great book or anything recently. Hey, so did you? Yes, I do. I just wanted to know what message do you think your books are going to give to kids? Oh, that it. they can do anything regardless of what their, uh, how they're born, their color, their nationality. They are multi-cultural uh, books. I try to introduce, mm -hmm. um, I make them educational by introducing different children from different nationalities. Mm -hmm. And Carter kind of say, um, like, Lila means light in Arabic. Mm -hmm. Or Layla means okay. death. Or, you know, Dela right. means um, light in Hindi. So, wow, well, mm -hmm. that sounds really interesting. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much for joining us. Stay mm -hmm. tuned. We will be back with a motivational speaker mm -hmm. that will enlighten us on her most recent work. I'm pleased to welcome our next guest, motivational speaker, author, and poetress, Allison Gregory Daniels. Thank you for joining us today. Thank you for inviting me. So, what inspired you to write these books? Um, I was inspired. My mom is a writer. She enjoys writing. And um, I just took on from there and started writing my own books and learning mm -hmm. how to um, share with others. Okay. Does your faith for education inspire your um, writings? Yes, my faith actually does because a lot of my books are inspired um, by the Word of God and it's also by um, helping others um, to believe and trust in what they're doing um, in everyday life. What are you most thankful for out of this uh, experience? I am most thankful for um, my daughters and for God actually trusting me to be able to instill um, positive words and inspirational words to people all over the world. Ultimately, what do you want readers to gain from your books? Ultimately, what I would like for them to gain is first of all, enjoy reading my book. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, being able to keep, keep their faith mm -hmm. and believe in what they're writing and to be able to share and to be able to educate along the way. When someone um, finishes your book, um, what would you like them to do? What would you like them to go out there and do after fin they finish this? I would love for them to go out and write their own book and tell their yes. story and inspire um, people, um, mainly children and um, young adults, to be able to talk about the things that they have gone through, which will help someone else along the way. Mm -hmm. And what are your goals as a writer? My goal as a writer after I finish writing these books would be to go out and to speak and to teach and inspire others um, again to be able to write their own books mm -hmm. and you know possibly do my own children's book if mm -hmm. possible. Um, I'm not an artist <laughs> but um, I am an artist as far as an author and writing and being mm -hmm. able to go out and speak. Do you set out to educate, educate, entertain, inspire, illuminate? <laughs> I actually do. So all of that, educate, illuminate, inspire, all motivate, in yeah, all of that in one. Um, and to try and make a difference. Because if there's one thing that I can say to make a difference, mm -hmm. um, then I have changed your life. So hopefully when um, people meet me, um, whatever walk in life they've gone through or whatever journey they're in now um, in their life, hopefully when they meet me I have said something or my book has um, inspired them to be able to, you know, live again or laugh again or dream again or write again. So can you kind of give us some of the, I guess, what, would, what, would, what were the challenges that you faced when you decided that you wanted to 
go into writing and actually getting your books out to mm -hmm. the general public? Um, some of the challenges I faced uh, would have been with um, trying to pick the right publishing company, trying to um, get the right um, editor, because not everyone, not every editor can relate to what I was writing or what another author is writing, so you had to kind of make sure that you had the right author, I mean the right editor. Um, I had to make sure that I had the right illustrator. Mm -hmm. um, so there were a lot of things that um, went into trying to bring the book to, for, um, to light. All right. <laughs> Definitely. Well, I see that you have different subjects, Bully yes. Me No More, Facing Tomorrow, uh, life goes on black man. Were these things that you faced personally or were these just subjects that you just wanted to touch on to help others? Now the first book, um, Bully Me No More, that's actually my daughter's book. She's nine years old and I am the co-author on that one. Mm -hmm. The second book, Facing Tomorrow, um, that's my life experiences along with Life Goes On mm -hmm. and those are life experiences that I wanted to share and prayerfully will help uh, another young lady along the way mm -hmm. to let her know that life does go on after the things that you've gone through in life. Mm -hmm. And then black men, I love you. I think um, uh, black men have so much going on that if we just take the time to let them know that, you know, we love them, you know, your sisters, mm -hmm. um, your mom, your uh, friend, we love you. Mm -hmm. And we care a lot about you. And that's a um, collection of inspirational um, love poems, and then there's like a love letter in the beginning of it. Mm -hmm. So um, it's like a variety of okay, writings yeah. that I do. <laughs> <laughs> and I just have one last quick question. What okay. kind of advice would you give someone who is aspiring to start writing their own books? I would say start writing. Um, jot something mm -hmm. down. Start um, going around different places and picking out ideas and seeing where do you want to go from there. Um, but I would say write it down. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And just another quick one. Um, <laughs> okay. Do you have a favorite book? And if not, what's your favorite genre? Um, my favorite book would be the last one I just did, oh. which is Life Goes On. Mm -hmm. And I say that because that's one of the books where I really took everything that was of me and put in that book of everything that I was going through. And from that point, I was able to, I mean, I'm still getting emails from people that have enjoyed that book. Mm -hmm. So that's like one of my favorite books. Okay. So that's one of your favorite books out, is that, now do you have a favorite one outside of the ones that you've written, mm -hmm. or? Um, I truly enjoy uh, my, reading Maya Angelou's books. Um, and mm -hmm. I think that's one, and um, I think that's it. That's well, it. That's you know, she wrote so many different yes. great works, so that goes on, definitely. Yes. I just have one more question. Do your okay. books um, pertain strictly to women, or is it just all of, like, you know, can men take something from your book, or do you just strictly um, gear your books towards women? No, they're not geared just toward women, um, mm -hmm. and actually they're geared toward children, men, and women, because the one for um, Bully Me No More mm -hmm. is for children in elementary school. The one life goes on, talks about your um, the purpose of your trials. Men and women both go through the same thing. Mm -hmm. And then um, Facing Tomorrow, um, which is a collection of inspirational stories. Okay, Great. well thank you so much. And thank, thank you, you to all of our guests for joining us today and also for sharing their wisdom, knowledge, and insight. My name is Jasmine Hall. <laughs> and I'm Kassara Clay. We hope our audience at home has enjoyed today's show. See you next time.